Well, I don't know about y'all, but I've paid to hear Cordes. It didn't sound that good before. That, that's, that's phenomenal. I appreciate it. Boy, they had something to sing about too, didn't they? Jerusalem, the city of peace. You know, I think it reminds us that God has something in store for us that's really, it's beyond our comprehension. We get glimpses of it in the Bible. We can sing about it and we can imagine but we don't yet fully know how wonderful it's going to be. But because we know God's character and His grace, I think we can trust in Him that it's worth waiting for and it's going to be good. And that's what that song is about. It's about the home that God has for us. Well, today's passage is looking at the church at Philadelphia. And if you've ever had a time in your life you get a little discouraged or frustrated in the church, or maybe you've ever had this thought, have you ever wondered, does it really pay to be faithful? Now, after all, we see so many people in the church, and, and uh, uh, they get involved in all kinds of things, and then, well, they come back, and then they just ask for forgiveness, and it's like they get a clean state. Does it seem fair, does it? Have you, ever, have you ever thought about, well, they receive the same reward? Does it really pay for me to be faithful my entire life and continually do everything that God wants me to do to the best of my ability? Well, I think the passage today, the answer is a resounding yes, that faithfulness pays. As the Lord spoke to the church at Philadelphia, he had nothing, nothing to criticize them about. This passage, as we look at Philadelphia, it was nothing but praise and commendation for the church for their faithfulness. And as he spoke to them and encouraged them, he encouraged them by saying that he had a great reward in store for them for their faithfulness. And I, I, one of the things that I've said in the past few weeks, and I think it's something for us to, important for us to all realize is that it's easy to do anything for a short period of time. The true test is being faithful and consistent to the end. And that's what the Lord's calling us to in terms of our worship of Him and our service in the church. It's not that there would be one time in our life that we got excited or one time in our life that we made a sacrifice, but that is our lifestyle from now until the end. Whether that means for you that you see the Lord return or it means that you die in faithfulness. The Lord is calling us to be faithful and to press on. And there's a couple reasons that we should do it. The Bible teaches us that we serve and we worship out of gratitude and thanksgiving for what He's done for us. And the second great motivation is what we're looking at today, the fact that the Lord has a reward for all those that are faithful to Him. So I want to ask you to stand with me out of honor and reverence for God's Word as we read Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. The Bible says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you, because you have kept my word about patient endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray together. Father, I pray today that we might be encouraged, motivated to be faithful, and to press on in our faith and our service to you. Father, I pray for every person listening. I pray that they would believe with all their heart that you can open doors that no one can shut. And Lord, we look forward to the new Jerusalem. And as John closed out this book, Revelation, we pray 
Even so, come, Lord Jesus, soon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Do you know that the Lord is able to reward the faithful? He's able. We think about many times people in life want to do something. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody in need and you just really didn't know how to help them or maybe you didn't have the means to help them. And you might have every intention in the world of wanting to help them, but you're just not able to help them. There's nothing that you can do. When we think about the Lord, He not only intends to help, but the Lord is able to help. He has the ability to keep His promise to reward the faithful. In these letters, as we've looked at the introductions, the Lord has de described Himself in ways that relate to His message to the churches. And so look at how He describes Himself in this letter to Philadelphia. It says in verse 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, and here's how he describes himself, the word of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. You see, Jesus is able to reward us because he's the Messiah. That's what he's claiming in these passages. He alludes to things from the Old Testament. There's three statements here. First of all, he says that he is the Holy One, the Holy One. He says, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One. In Revelation chapter 15, verse 4, this is what the Bible says about this Holy One. It says, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? Notice what it says. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your Righteous acts have been revealed. You know, the Bible teaches that the Lord and the Lord alone is holy. God is calling us to become holy, and He's enabled us to become holy. You see, none of us are without sin, but yet when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what God does is He takes Jesus' payment for sin, and He credits it to our account so that we are seen through the righteousness of Christ. So even though we're not holy in and of ourselves, we can become holy through Him. But He is truly holy. There's never been a time in His life that He's ever sinned in any way. God's character is absolutely perfect and flawless. And so His righteousness is not an imputed righteousness like we have his righteousness is in and of itself of his own character his own being and his own actions he's the holy one and when jesus says the words of the holy one he describes himself as god himself and notice what he also says the first phrase he says the holy one and then he says in the second part of uh, that statement here he says the words of the holy one and then he says the true one the true one there's a lot of things in life that seem true that aren't really many times as we grow up we, we think things are true because somebody told us or perhaps we misperceived what was going on and then later we realize that the things that we thought were true were, were just not true this is kind of what science is science is the process of realizing everything that we thought was true is no longer true and now we've figured out something else this is how science works that's why they don't prescribe the same medications they did when you were a child because they, they found out those were causing cancer. And so then they, they, they stopped. And so they discovered more. And so things that they thought were true were not necessarily true. There's a time when man thought the, the world was flat and if you sail far enough, you just kind of drop off the end. And then, then we discovered that it was, that it was round. It, it seemed true, but it, but it wasn't true. And there are many things in life that, that seem true. And there are a lot of religions around the world that are teaching things that that seem true they they, they sound right they, they kind of make sense they they seem to be true but jesus said i'm the way you don't miss the the second part of what he said he said and the truth i'm the way the truth and the life so when we look at jesus and we listen to his teaching we receive what's true. There may be many other things that seem to be true. But the Bible says there's the way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. But Jesus is really truth, and he leads to life. And so he says to the church there, he says the Holy One, the words of the true one. And then notice this, he says that he has the key of David. 
This refers to Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. Listen to what the Bible says. It says, And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. He shall shut, and none shall open. You say, what does that refer to? Well, God made a promise to David that he was going to establish his throne forever. And as God made that promise, in the short term, he was referring to a military kingdom. But in the long term, he was referring to the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah that would come through him. And so God makes this promise to David. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, this is what he says to David. He says, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so God made this promise to David. He fulfilled it through the Lord Jesus Christ. In the first century, there were a couple of different institutions. There was the temple, and there was only one temple. That was in Jerusalem. And then there was the synagogue. And the synagogue was a local place of teaching. The synagogue was, would be what the church is today. It's the place where the Jews gathered on the Sabbath today, and they listened to the word uh, proclaimed and taught, and they uh, worshiped God through the synagogue. And so there was only one temple, and the temple was the place of sacrifice and offering. There was only one because there was only one God. But the synagogue was the place of teaching. The word synagogue literally means gathering together. Uh, by the way, that's what the word church means also. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, early in the first century, uh, the word church was used to refer to the synagogue, and the word synagogue was used to refer to the church because in the minds of Christians, there was absolutely no difference. They weren't starting a new religion. They were just continuing what God had always called them to do. But the Jews who refused to accept Jesus as the Messiah, they began to expel the Christians out of the synagogue so that they were no longer welcome and no longer able to go and worship and learn. And so they had to worship separately. And so they were, they were shut out. And Jesus said to those that were shut out, he said, I have the key. And I can open doors that no man can shut, and I can shut doors that no man can open. And so when you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't worry about the doors that people shut, because the only door that really matters is the one that he can open, and that's the door to life, the door to relationship with the Father. And so he said to the church at Philadelphia that was small and that was persecuted, that was ostracized by the, by the Jews out of the synagogue. He said to them, he said, the words of the Holy One, that is God himself, the one that the Jews claimed to be worshiping. He said, the words of the Holy One, the true one, the one that the Jews in the synagogue said was a false prophet. He said, the true one, the one who has the key of David, that is the, one, the Messiah, the one who fulfills the promise that God made through him who can open doors that no one can shut and shut doors that no one can open. You see, Jesus is able to reward us because he is the Messiah, and he has the ability because he is the Holy One, the true one, the Messiah. And so he says to this church that they should not be afraid of those that have shut them out of the synagogue, but they should continue to worship him in faithfulness, knowing that they would one day be rewarded. You see, his ability, it should move us to faithfulness. Look at verse 8. Jesus said, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. He said to them, he said, I know your works. I know what you've been doing. And he said, I've set before you an open door. Friend, I think it's exciting to know that Jesus has set before us an open door. It's up to us to decide whether we want to walk through it or not. And if we decide to follow him, there's nobody that can shut that door or keep us from following him. 
And so our hope and our security is not in those around us or not in religious leaders. Our hope and security is in the Lord Jesus Christ himself who has the power to open doors that no person can shut. And so we can depend upon him is that when we follow him, we'll never regret it. It'll never be in vain. These people were worshiping and they were serving. And the Lord said about them, he said, I know that you have but little power. Apparently, the church at Philadelphia was a very small church. And he said, I know you have but little power. You know, I don't know if you've ever had a time in your life when you thought uh, that you individual as a Christian perhaps were insignificant. Maybe you felt like your church was insignificant. Uh, you know, I've, as I got here, one of the things that I heard from all the different comments, uh, it seems that some people have a little bit of a small town complex. I hear things like, well, you know, uh, we sure hope you like it here because, you know, there's not many places to eat. And I don't really understand that because that's all we've done since we got here is eat. And then uh, I, people will say, well, I hope you like it here because, you know, there's really nowhere to shop. And uh, I think that's a blessing. You don't know how great that is. <laughs> but it's just all a matter of perspective, you know. And so I, I don't know if you've ever sat around and thought, well, you know, we're just, we're just a, a small church here in, in Madisonville. There's, there's not really much we can do to, to change the world. And Jesus said to that small little church in Philadelphia, he says, I know that you have little power, but he says, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. You see, as we think about that we may have little power, but we serve one who is all powerful. Isn't, isn't that amazing? We serve one that is all powerful. This is what the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4. It says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. That, that is those that are against him. And this is what he says. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so the Lord said to the church in Philadelphia, he said, I know you have little power, but you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. And that's what the Lord is looking for in his church. That we would keep his word and not deny his name. You see, the faithful church obeys God's word. He says that you have kept my word. I think that we're under more pressure today from our culture in America than any other time I can think about in my lifetime to deny and disobey, dilute, and change God's word. Uh, when I was a teenager, God's word wasn't extremely popular. But, but now, in, in this day, it's, it's extremely unpopular. There, there's so many things in the Scripture that contradict what people want to do in our culture. And many people have proven that one of the easiest and fastest ways to grow a church is to either distort God's Word or ignore it. If we simply never talk about the things that people don't want to hear and just talk about pie-in-the-sky dreams all the time, uh, we, we could pack this place out. But, you know, there's a lot of people packing out stadiums all across America today. But that doesn't make them a church. The church, the faithful church, keeps God's word. And so we study it. And we conform our lives to it. And we obey it. And we proclaim it. The faithful church also proclaims Jesus. Notice what he says in verse 8. And yet you have kept my word. And he says, and have not denied my name the lord is looking for people who are faithful to proclaim him you know even peter had a time of weakness in his life when peter was at the trial of jesus he was outside by the fire warming himself and people came to him and kept asking him about uh was he a follower of jesus aren't you one of him and three times he he denied him and yet peter repented of that the Lord forgave him, and he went on to be one of the boldest witnesses that the early church ever saw. And that's what God's calling us to. There may have been a time in our life that we weren't bold witnesses, but now's the time to repent of that and be open and clear about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus said about this, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. He says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. 
I said to the church at Philadelphia, you've kept my word, you have not denied my name. That's what the Lord is looking for, that we would be faithful to him, to obey his word, and that we would proclaim him, that we believe in him. And we proclaim him so that other people might come to believe in him. Verses 9 and 10, one of the things that we see about the Lord's faithfulness is that the Lord is more faithful than we could ever be. Notice what the Bible says in verse 9. He says, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Well, the Lord has made us his people. We look in the Old Testament, we know that God called Abraham, and out of that, uh, his promises to Abraham, he called the nation of Israel. And they were his people, the Jews. And yet he said here about the local synagogue, he said that they were a synagogue of Satan. And what, what he meant was that they were doing the will of Satan and not the will of his father. They had rejected him as, as the Messiah. And when Jesus said they say that they're Jews but they're not, they lie, he didn't mean that, that their birth lineage was not Jewish. They certainly were. What he meant was is that the true Jews were the ones that recognize and worship him. And so when we come to believe that he's the Messiah, we receive the promises that God made to his people. And God, God has made us his people. This is what Jesus said to a Gentile centurion that came seeking his son to be healed. This is what he said to him. He said in Matthew eight eleven. he said, I tell you, many will come from east and east west and recline at table with abraham isaac and jacob in the kingdom of heaven friend when it says many will come from east and west that, that's that's us he's referring to those that were not jews by birth but were jews by choice that believed and walked through the open door that he put before us and he said he's talking about this this great feast and celebration at the end of time and he says many will come and he says, while the sons of the kingdom, that, that is those who were Jews by birth, will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friend, that's, that's the description of hell itself. Paul refers to those who say they are Jews and are not in Romans chapter 2, verse 28. He says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew, listen to this, is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. What Paul was talking about, circumcision was the mark that identified Jews. And Paul said the thing that identifies us as Jews is not an outward thing, it's an inward thing. When God circumcises the heart, not the physical body, that is, he changes our heart. Jesus talked about this when he said, they will know us by our love for one another. And so Jesus said to the church at Philadelphia, he said, he, said he knows about those that are a synagogue of Satan. They may be Jews by birth, but they're Gentiles, and pagans by choice. And those of us that are here today, I, I don't know if there's anybody here that, that's uh, a Jew or not. But I can tell you this, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're an heir to every promise that God ever made to people. And so he said to the church at Philadelphia, he said, I know your works. He said, you've been faithful. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. And he said, those that call themselves Jews but are not, he says, one day they're going to come and they're going to bow at your feet and they're going to know that I have loved you. Isaiah 49, 23. The Lord made this promise and this prophecy to the people of the Old Testament. It's a prophecy about the Gentiles, the unbelieving Gentiles coming and acknowledging one day. This is what he says. He says, kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am in the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. You say, what does that mean? It means 
that Jesus told the church at Philadelphia. Those that many, or if not all, were Gentiles by birth. That they were going to receive the promise that God had made to Israel about the Gentiles. You see, Jesus, as he refers to this, he's, he's turned around the very situation that the Jews were claiming. They were claiming to be God's people because by birth they were Jews. And the Lord said that they claimed to be Jews, but they were not, that they lied. And when he said, I will make those come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I loved you. This is the promise that God made to his people in the Old Testament. The Lord is saying that it now applies to them. Because even though they are not Jews by birth, they have become Jews by choice. They are heirs to the promise because they believe that he is the Messiah. And we may live in a time right now where people mock us and deride us and persecute us in all kinds of ways. But one day, one day, the world will know that the Lord loves all his faithful followers. And that's the promise that we have here. The Lord is gracious. Look at verse 10. He says, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. Well, this promise, uh, it's not a promise that we'll never face any kind of trials, but it is a promise that the Lord rewards faithfulness. And you know, in verses 11 through 13, one of the things that we see that uh, the group sang about earlier just before the message is that the Lord is preparing a reward for us that is absolutely beyond our comprehension. You know, when the Lord returns, he will reward the faithful. Look at verse 11. He said, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have that no one may seize your crown. Now, I don't know when the Lord is re returning. Just a few years ago, there was a guy out of California that had uh, claimed that he discovered the, the day and the time. I don't know if you all uh, had any billboards up in your area, but in uh, Atlanta, there were billboards all over Atlanta. And they had uh, posted the, the day and the time and uh, you know, the, the only good that came out of that is a lot of people ask me a bunch of questions that might not otherwise. And so it was a good conversation starter. But you know what the Bible says about that? It says that nobody's going to know the time. The angels don't even know. It's a secret from them. Only the Lord knows. But he says, I'm coming soon. So I don't know when he's going to return, but one day he's going to return absolutely unexpectedly. And friend, if you're alive to see it, if you're faithful to him, there's going to be a great reward when he comes. And so he says, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have that no one may seize your crown. As we think about this, it ought to move us to consistency in our faith. Verse 12, one of the things that we see is that our reward is not temporary, but it's eternal. Notice what it says. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on his name the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. There was all kinds of uh, pagan worship of different gods in their day. And I was reading this week that one of the things that they would do at times to, to honor a person if there was somebody who was a great civic leader or somebody's great military leader or whatever, uh, sometimes in those pagan temples what they would do is that they would add a new column and it would be like a statue dedicated to that person. And so the, the Lord is not literally promising this, but he was alluding to something that they would understand that one day when he returns, if we're faithful to him, that we're going to be rewarded greatly. And this reward, it's eternal. He says, never shall he go out of it. Never. Verse 13. This is the way that these, these letters end to the churches. 
It ends with this warning. And you know, when the Lord gave this message to John and he inspired him to write the book of Revelation, he knew that each of these seven would be included. And so we have this phrase that recurs over and over and over again. And when we think about the Lord has repeated something over and over and over again in Scripture, it should really get our attention. And so this is what he says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so what does that mean? It means that if you can understand this, you need to respond. And I'm telling you this. The message to the church of Philadelphia the Lord said, you're faithful. Uh, they, were, they were doing a wonderful job of keeping his word and proclaiming him, not, not denying his name. And the Lord said, just keep it up. Keep up what you're doing, and someday there'll be a great reward. Well, that's the same message to us today. That God is calling us to be faithful. That God is calling us to press on. That whether we see his return or whether we see death, for as long as we're here, that we would be faithful, that we would keep his word and not deny his name. It's not as easy as it sounds. There's times that we get discouraged. There's times that there's opposition from without. There's times that there's opposition from within, from our sinful nature. There's a million reasons why it's hard and sometimes it's a bumpy road. There's times you get discouraged and frustrated and sometimes you even feel overwhelmed. But when you get those moments, remember that the Lord said, there is a great, great reward for everyone who is faithful. And as we think about that reward, it should move us to continue on and to press on in faithfulness. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that we serve a God who can open doors that nobody can shut. And Father, I pray today if there's anybody here that's never made a decision, Lord, to believe, to accept the invitation you've given us, to walk through that open door. Father, I pray today that they might call upon you in prayer, just confess their sin, ask for forgiveness, Lord, and be saved. And Father, I pray right now for the believer. Maybe they're discouraged or they're frustrated, they they feel overwhelmed. Father, I pray that the promise of reward might encourage them today. I pray that it might move them to press on in faithfulness. And Lord, if you were to have a message to our church today, I, I really don't know what it would be. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to move forward from today in such a way that the letter to First Baptist Madisonville would be to the faithful church. Father, we we give you the honor and we give you the glory for everything that has taken place here in this place. And Father, I pray right now as we offer an invitation that you'd have your way in the lives of everyone present. For it's in Christ's name that we pray.